Hi, it's Robin. Fellow YouTuber Stephen Combs, over at his channel Retro Combs, has been doing a series about the Commodore Plus 4 computer, and specifically, he's been going through the user's manual for it. He's already covered the first half of the book, and at the same time I'm releasing this video, he's releasing a video covering the last half of the book, the Plus 4 Encyclopedia. So you might want to check out his video either before or after you finish this one. He asked if I would cover section 5 on page 184 about TEDMON, which is a machine language monitor built into the Plus 4. So that's what we'll be looking at today. Now part of why I thought this would be an interesting topic is just because I haven't covered the Plus 4 very much on my channel. But another aspect is that TEDMON has much in common with the machine language monitors that are available for other computers, whether it's the famous Supermon by Jim Butterfield, which is available for pretty much every 8-bit Commodore computer, or the monitor built into the Commodore 128, or the monitors built into utility cartridges for the Commodore 64, like the Action Replay, or my favorite, the Super Snapshot. So even if you're not interested in the Plus 4, or you just don't think you're going to be using a Plus 4, you'll still be able to apply most of what we look at today to the Commodore 64 or your other favorite Commodore machine. So just to read the introduction to Ted Mon here in the book, incidentally the, the layout of this book is pretty nice, but terribly, they put the page numbers right down here in the gutter. Even on these pages, it's... <laughs> what were they thinking? You try to find a page, you can't just flip and look in the in the corners as you should be able to. Anyway. Okay, so section five, Tedmon. Introduction. Tedmon is a built-in machine language program which lets you easily write machine language programs. Tedmon includes a machine language monitor, a mini assembler, and a disassembler. Machine language programs written using Tedmon can run by themselves or be used as very fast subroutines for basic programs since Tedmon has the ability to coexist peacefully with BASIC. Now it's interesting that they stress its use for writing machine language programs, because while you can write machine language programs with a monitor like Tedmon, that's not really its primary use. But before we get to that more, why is this monitor called Tedmon? Well, it's a combination of TED which is short for text editing device. Not a very cool name, but it fits with the three letter acronyms that Commodore was so fond of. But the TED is the main custom chip in the Plus 4 and Commodore 16 and other machines from the TED series. Just in case you don't know about this, the TED machines were originally conceived by Commodore founder Jack Trammell as an ultra low cost machine so Commodore could compete at the bottom end of the home computer market, as originally the Commodore 64 was intended as a mid-range computer. But by the time the TED was ready, Tremel had left Commodore, and the Commodore 64 was already priced really low. So what did Commodore do? They priced the Plus 4 higher than the C64, even though it was a largely inferior machine by design to the Commodore 64. Of course it didn't sell well, but it still does have some superior features to the C64, such as a better basic, more colors, and back on topic, a built-in machine language monitor. So that's the TED part. How about MON? Well, that's short for monitor, a word I've already used quite a few times in this video, specifically a machine code monitor, or a machine language monitor. Those two terms are often used interchangeably. And it's named a monitor because it allows you to monitor or view and modify the CPU registers and memory. Now you can use it to write machine language programs, but generally if you're going to write a longer program, maybe even anything more than just a few lines, you really should use a full featured symbolic assembler. However, a monitor is an excellent place to start to learn machine language programming. Okay, now we're going to work through all the features in TEDMON. I won't necessarily go through them in alphabetical order like they are in the manual, 
Instead, I'll show them in groups of related commands so there's a more logical progression, and we'll end up revisiting some commands as part of exploring other commands as they're introduced. So when we start up the plus four, we're at the familiar ready prompt in basic, and we can enter tedmon by typing in the command monitor and return. And it helpfully tells us monitor that we're in the monitor, and it automatically shows the register display, which shows the current status of the CPU registers, such as the program counter, stack register, accumulator, X register, Y register, and the stack pointer. We'll look at those in more detail in a bit. So all the commands in Tedmon and most monitors are single letters that are easy to remember, such as A for assemble, and then it expects you to tell where in memory you're going to assemble to. We'll be using locations like 2000 hex today. So we'll just make a short program like uh, load A from location FF1D, which for you C64 programmers, that's basically equivalent to D012, the raster line counter in the C64. This is the TED equivalent. And then We'll end it with one just to take the low bit. You might know where I'm going with this. We're doing a plus four version of 10 print in machine language. Then we'll add carry with CD, which is the hex equivalent of decimal 205, which is the slash. Somewhat confusingly, the addresses are always hex in Tedmon, but you do not put a dollar sign in front of the initial address. When it's a parameter, you do have to put the dollar sign. Kind of inconsistent, but that's just how these work. It's kind of convention. And then we're going to jump to the FFD2 subroutine that prints the character. And we're going to branch if carry clear back to location 2000. So this is an endless loop that grabs a semi random number, the current Y raster line that the TED is drawing, takes the low bit of it adds it to character 205, so it's either 205 or 206, prints that character, and then loops again. If you want a full analysis of this, check out my recent video about 10 print machine language. Okay, so that's the assemble command. You can type machine language instructions directly into memory. It's not a full featured assembler that allows you to use labels, binary, decimal, and other convenience features. It just lets you type in machine language instructions and they're assembled immediately into memory. So that's the A or assemble command. Next is the G or go command, which starts execution at the specified address. So we'll tell it go 2000 and the monitor will transfer control to that little program we just wrote. And there it is. It's the 10 print maze scrolling very quickly by. Somewhat strangely, the plus four has two control keys, but neither of them slow down the output from print. On the C64 and VIC-20, you can hold down control and slow down the scrolling from FFD2. On the plus four, for whatever reason, that's on the Commodore key now. So you can see the output, that's a lot slower. The plus four also has no restore key, so you can't go stop restore. But fortunately, over on the right side, next to the power switch, it does have an actual reset button. So we'll press that, and the computer resets to basic. And now we can go back into the monitor. By the way, you can do a shortcut M Shift O instead of typing monitor in full. And we're back in. Next, we can disassemble memory, D, and tell it what location in memory. Again, our program 2000, it'll disassemble about 20 bytes worth of code. What the disassembly does is takes the, what we can call machine code, the hex bytes that represent the program and turn them into the machine language that's more readable over here on the right. And it doesn't really know where our program ends. It continues to attempt to disassemble these commands but FF isn't even a valid machine language instruction, so it just prints these question marks as a result. Another related command is M for memory display, 
And this is like the disassemble command, but it doesn't show the machine language. It just shows the hex bytes, the machine code, or data, whatever happens to be in memory here. So here's the machine code for our program. And then further on here are all these zeros and Fs. Those are uninitialized memory. Clear the screen. Both the disassemble command and the memory command accept a range. So if we disassemble from 2000 to 2000B as another parameter, then we just see the program. And if likewise we display memory from 2000 to 2000B, it'll actually always display in groups of eight. But you'll see here that the machine code on the left, AD, 1D, FF, and then 29 and so on, is just display here just hex bytes, AD, 1D, FF, 29, 01, and so on. So both those commands are equivalent except one actually attempts to interpret it as if that's machine language, whether it is or not. We can also use the memory command to look at other parts of memory, such as 818E. That is part of the basic ROM that's built into the plus four, the code that allows your computer to talk basic. So on the left is the hex bytes, and on the right is a Petsky or Commodore ASCII interpretation of that. And you might see some familiar words here. If you're a basic programmer, you might see some familiar words such as and, for, then next, data, and so on. So on the left side is the Petsky equivalent, and on the right is the text. But you notice that the last letter of each word here, hex 45 is the Petsky for the character E, 4E for the character N in end. Now C4 is a much bigger number. Well, that's actually 44 with the high bit set. So it ends up adding 80 hex for a total of C4. See, you can still read that as end, but really it's E-N-D, but the last letter has its high bit set. BASIC uses that as a space and probably a code savings as well, that the end of each keyword, so as BASIC is searching for keywords, or for that matter, wanting to print them out in a program listing, the high bit is set as a flag. Okay, one other thing we can do is look at screen memory on the plus four, Video memory defaults to 0C00. On the C64, it's at 0400. So if we look at memory there, we'll see it's just full of these two zeros. And over here, we just see that it's all these reversed blanks. So that's because a blank screen is filled with 20 hex. That's 32 decimal. This brings us to our next command is that the greater than symbol allows us to modify memory. And the M command automatically prints out these greater than symbols for us. So we can go over here, and if we want to change the top left corner of screen memory, it's currently a blank. Let's put a zero one in there, which is the screen code for the letter A. And look at the top left corner when I hit return, an A appears up there. Now if we go over a little bit more, we can put a zero two, and a B should appear one space over. So this greater than symbol requires a memory location, and then you can give it up to eight bytes of memory to modify. So if you wish, you can type that in directly, like 0C04. And if I want to put the number three, that's the letter C, that'll appear up in the top corner as well. And you'll notice that it automatically updated the whole line it does that just so it plays nice with this M command, refreshing that whole line when you've modified it. Okay, next is the R command, and that displays the registers. We saw those at the beginning when we first entered the monitor. So if we write a short program, like assemble to 2000, and we store A in OC100, and then we add, the command break. Okay, let's try go 2000. Look at the top left corner of the screen. It changed from an R to an H. 
And then it says break on the screen. We're back at the monitor prompt. So what happened here? We executed this code that stored the accumulator in OC00, that's the top left corner of the screen. But you notice our program didn't actually define the accumulator, but you'll notice that the accumulator was set to eight. So when you tell the monitor to execute code at 2000, it will execute the code with the registers set as you see here. So if we now change the accumulator back to one, and then go 2000, again, look at the top left corner. Now it's changed to an A because we put the one, the screen code for the accumulator in there before we started. And what about this break? Well, we ended our program with a break op code, which is essentially a break point. Most monitors for Commodore machines intercept the break vector that is when the CPU encounters a break op code, it jumps to a vector that is a 16 bit pointer to some code. So the 6502 jumps to the location in its break vector, which happens to be the Tedmon code. So far we've been putting a parameter, the address we want to go to. What we actually can do is change the program counter to location 2000. So it'll change the accumulator to two, so it should print a B. Nothing happens, but if I just type G on its own, look at the top left corner, it prints the B and then breaks again. If you just say go, it'll start executing code at whatever location the program counter's at. Now, when we type the R command, it prints out these registers. That's actually not really what's in the program counter or the accumulator at this moment. Because of course, really, the plus four is busy running Tedmon. It's busy doing things like flashing the cursor, reading the keyboard, and interpreting our commands. So of course, the program counter isn't really frozen at 2005, and the accumulator isn't really too. While I'm cursoring around or whatever, typing instructions, the processor is busy doing running all kinds of code in the ROM. These registers are kind of like an illusion. They're what will be put back into the CPU register next time we type go. So now that it's point 2005, if we go, <laughs> it ran some other code. What, what's even there? Probably just a break. Oh no, it did the add carry. Well, anyway, that was kind of unpredictable. And so what I didn't mention is one more command here is the semicolon. The R command automatically prints that semicolon. That semicolon is pre-printed for our convenience, and it allows us to change any of these CPU registers just by typing over them and pressing return. So moving on, we have the F, the fill command, which fills memory with a specified byte. Let's fill from location 0C00 to 0CFF with the byte FF. And it fills it with this checkerboard. You see, I moved the cursor on the corner there. FF is this small two by two checkerboard pattern. You might want to fill memory with an alternating pattern like screen code one and two, which would be ABAB. But unfortunately, Tedmon does not support a multi byte fill but other monitors like the super snapshot monitor does. So it just ignores extra parameters and is just filling with the one byte. Okay, so let's just put another little very short program to use for the next. So we're going to increment FF19. And for you Commodore 64 programmers, that's like D020, the border color on the VIC-2. But instead of just being one of 16 colors, the plus four actually supports 128 colors, much like the early Atari consoles and computers. And then we'll just jump back to 2000. Okay, so there's a very short program. And we can look at it. And we can even just run it just so you can see what it does. Go 2000. There. The border is very rapidly changing. Actually, I noticed that the borders are really small on the plus four compared to the Commodore 64. 
hopefully you can see enough of that in my video capture. It really is quite a small border and it's just rapidly cycling through all 128 colors. Reset. Okay, so there's our program still in memory. Now the next command we're going to look at is T for transfer, transferring code from one section of memory to another. Well, at least that's what the short description in the manual says. But I don't know why it said transfer code. We'll look at that. You tell it from transfer from 2000 to 2005. That's inclusive. And we'll transfer it to 3000. Okay, now let's look at the code at 3000 to 3005. So this is what we've transferred over or copied, but you'll see that our new copy of it is still jumping back to location 2000. Really, if we want to transfer code, we would want it to relocate any absolute addresses. Like what's the point in transferring a copying code if it's still jumping back to the old location? So that's why really that short description in the book, I don't know why they said code. It should be transfers data because it's not treating it with any kind of special context that code requires. It's just copying the bytes from one place to another. So we can use the C, which isn't copy, but compare. It will compare ranges of memory. So let's compare from 2000 to 2005 with the new copy at 3000. And it reports nothing back. That means that there's no differences at all. Let's fix the code. So now it loops back to 3000 hacks. And now let's compare 2000, 2005 with 3000. Okay, so now it's reporting back that there is a difference at location 2005. Or to look at that the other way, let's compare from 3000 to 3005, the new copy with the original. It always reports back the difference as it applies to the range specified, not the destination address. Okay, so it's saying that location 3005 is different now. And if we look, here's 3003, 4, and 5. Yep, that used to be a 20, now it's a 30. So that's reported as being different. And likewise, we can execute that code now at 3000. That's the same thing, cycling through all the colors in the border. There's another command, hunt. Let's look through all of memory from location zero to FFFF, and then put a single quote. We'll search for monitor, but I'll leave off the last letter. I'll explain that in a moment. We're searching for monitor through all of memory, and it's reporting back four locations that match monitor. What are they? Okay, well, the first one, is at location 200, or well, 020A is the hit. So right there, yep, yeah, we see Monito. I started at 200 so we could see, do you recognize this M0200? Well, that's the command I had just typed in here. What this area is, is the command buffer. Whenever you type something in and press return, it's stored in this location. So the last command we typed was M space 0, 2, 0, 0, and then 0D is the carriage return. But after it, we see an F and then a space and the single quote. That's the leftover from the previous command that we typed in. And then when we looked at the command buffer, we overwrote some of it, but it doesn't actually wipe it out each time. The old data is still in there. The next hit we'll look at is 250. And here's 25D. We see Monito again. Well, this area of memory is normally reserved for the current file name that the kernel is trying to load, but it seems that Tedmon actually uses that file name space temporarily as the search string, as a place to store the string it's searching for. So that's why we found that in memory as well. 
How about the next one is 836C? Well, here's the word monitor in full. And we can see this is, again, that area of the basic ROM where all the keywords are stored. While all these characters are in the 40 and 50 hex range, see that the last one, letter R, has its high bit set again. So that's why I did not search for monitor with an R because the search would not find this occurrence. It would actually just search for 52, which is a normal R without its high bit set. And the last one is CF37. Once again, here's the word monitor. And in this case, it's actually a string as part of the code for Tedmon itself. In addition to monitor, here's that message break that we've seen. Here's the program counter string that we've seen above the register display and error. So these are just static strings that are printed as part of the monitor running. So just like when we type the monitor command or M shift O shortcut, it helpfully prints monitor on the screen. Well, that's where that string comes from. Moving on is the X command that lets us exit from Tedmon back into basic. And now we've got our favorite print command available to us again and all the other features of basic. But we're not done with the monitor. Okay, one last group of commands here. There's our border flashing program still in memory. I got my micro IEC SD card drive hooked up. Although because the plus four doesn't have a regular cassette port, I've actually got powered over USB, but it otherwise works fine with the plus four. And what we're going to do is the save command prog, I'll call it device eight from location 2000. And unlike all the other instructions, the disk commands require commas between parameters. Not really sure why they did that. Maybe it's a concession to people who are so used to basic typing quote comma eight. And then we put the range of memory we want, but the last address is non-inclusive for save, while I believe all the other memory type commands that allow a range are inclusive. Just kind of a quirk that may have originated with Supermon. So let's save that. Clear the screen, exit back to basic, and we can do the directory command. And we can see here that our program has been saved. You can also use di shift r as a shortcut for the directory. But kind of strangely, the directory command has come over from the Commodore Pets basic four, the catalog command, or c shift a. They didn't bring that one over. So let's go back into the monitor. Okay, so we want to load that file back into memory so we can see it's already in memory. So what we should do is fill from 2000 to 2005 with zero and then disassemble from 2000 to 2005. And we can see that the program is gone. It's just full of breaks now. Take a break. And then we can just load prog comma eight and now disassemble it again. And our program's back in memory. Now, some monitors allow you to add an extra parameter after comma eight. Normally the program might load to location 2000 hex like we have here, but instead I want to load to 3000, but unfortunately Tedmon does not support that. It just gives you a little error question mark here, but super snapshot, I believe Supermon allows you to do that and others. And the last command available is V for verify. So let's verify that the program on disk matches what's in memory. And so it just says verifying. It doesn't actually say okay, but if it doesn't complain, that means it is okay. So if we look at our program again, now say we just changed this ever so slightly to jump to 2001. So we've only changed one byte. Let's verify prog comma eight. And this time we got a verifying error, which shows 
that the file on disk does not match what's in memory. Unfortunately, it does not show the address of the difference. That would actually be a useful kind of difference tool, but unfortunately it doesn't report that, but I guess better than nothing. Okay, and just one last feature to look at. If we look at location 7F8, well, showed a whole screen full, but it's currently set to zero. This particular byte controls whether Tedmon looks at the plus four's RAM or at ROM, at least in the places where there is ROM. So zero is the default, and that makes Tedmon show ROM. So if we look at location, say, 8200, again, that basic ROM that we've looked at several times, here's, here's the various basic commands. So let's change location 7F8 to 80 hex, that is setting the high bit. Okay, it's changed. Now, let's view memory at that same location. And now instead, you see it's just filled with uninitialized garbage here, just FFs and zero zeros. So we are now viewing the RAM at location 8200. Just like the Commodore 64, the plus four just has a CPU with a 16-bit address space that can address up to 64K addresses, 65,536 unique addresses. But both computers have 64K of RAM plus ROM plus IO, so they have to be overlaid. So this little flag is a concession to that so that you can look at these different areas of memory from the monitor. Okay, so that's our tour of Tedmon. Thanks to Stephen of Retrocombs for inviting me to contribute to his tour of the Plus 4 manual. If you haven't been following his series, I definitely suggest you check it out. There'll be a link in the video description. Thanks to my patrons for their support. Thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you next time. The 6502 is the CPU from me, produced by Moss Technology. Chuck Pedal made it with his team, those 8 bit registers are a dream. It first powered the Apple One, few realized what had begun. A low cost processor solution. Great machines use that chip, an inexpensive 40 pin.